And uh, Raja, do you hear me well now? I can, yes, I hear yeah, very okay. well. Okay, so like a uh, feedback me if I'm disappearing or something is wrong. Right now I hear you. Okay. So I just wanna see that the live streaming opens. Yes, okay, we've got this. And now I'm with you. Um, so hello everybody. We're very delighted uh, today to have uh, Dr. Raja Bughezel with us. Uh, Raja Bughezel is a staff scientist at uh, the High Energy Physics Division of Argonne National Laboratory since 2010. Before joining Argonne, Raja was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Zurich in Switzerland and the University of Würzburg in Germany after graduating from the University of Freiburg in Germany. Raja's research leverages a variety of effective field the theory techniques to understand and predict interactions at the LHC and other collider experiments to the percent level of precision. Raja is known for her work on Higgs predictions and jet production processes. Raja was named Emmy Nether Fellow of the Perimeter Institute in 2017. Her work on applying supercomputing techniques to enable previously intractable calculations in perturbative QCD was recognized with several leadership insight awards by the US Department of Energy. Raja has been a member of several international advisory committees and is currently a convener for the ongoing snow mass uh, process organized by the community of high energy physics in the US. Um, so without further ado, Raja, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me just see if I can share the screen. Let's see, here we go. And let's go to full screen mode. All right, do you see the slides well? Yes, I do. I see them. Great. Perfect. Well, thank you so very much, Michelle. Thanks for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I hope we'll all have a good time. Um, so I will be presenting a talk today on explorations in the standard model effective field theory beyond the leading order. It's based on a recent work we have done uh, through various papers so this is the outline of my talk. So I will start with um, a few slides of introduction just to set up the stage, define the framework, but also talk about the challenges and benefits of SMAFT uh, before addressing them later on in my talk. So one of these challenges is going to be focused on flood directions at the NHC and how to remove them. Um, the impact of dimension eight effects on Juliana, the LHC, and then how to disentangle dimension six and dimension eight effects through uh, low energy experiments such as the party violating ones uh, planned in the future. So, as you know very well, uh, there is a remarkable agreement between the standard model and, uh, and experiments over all sectors of theory and spanning orders of magnitude in cross section. Um, if you look at these two sample plots from uh, CMS and Atlas, you could see that. Um, the precision of these measurements and predictions is at a level of few to several percent. So the agreement we've had so far is actually relatively precise. Um, we have had, we have searched for new physics uh, in various sectors. This is just a sample of the searches that have been done. Uh, this is a plot from CMS. We haven't had any conclusive evidence of uh, physics beyond the standard model so far, despite this broad spectrum of searches. What we do see from all uh, the searches that have been done and, and what data seems to point to is that new physics mass scale seems to exceed or the limits seem to exceed or um, reach or exceed the TEV range. Uh, so there seems to be a mass gap between the standard model and new physics uh, states. So two things, we haven't seen new states and new physics or data seems to say that there is a mass gap. There is a third thing here. Um, it seems that new physics is likely or likely exhibits the standard model SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 gauge symmetry above the electric scale. So broken uh, with the Higgs doublet through SU3 cross U1, uh, just like in the standard model. So talking about this symmetry breaking is usually easiest when uh, we, through this so-called row parameter, which I'm defining here on the left in this red box, it's the ratio of the W mass squared to the Z mass squared times Weinberg angle squared, some, times some relative corrections uh, in the standard model. So in the standard model, this row zero is simply one. But if we have a symmetry breaking, uh, if it happens through uh, something more complicated, let's say a triplet, row zero will be different from one. And it actually, it will take uh, a more complicated form. So now currently data seems to point to the fact that row zero is very close to one, as you can see from this value here, uh, which I took from the PDG. 
So this puts stringent constraints on Higgs triplets, for example, and other sources of non stellar model symmetry breaking, but it doesn't for sure exclude other possibilities. Nobody says that we don't have a Higgs triplet, for example, hiding our data because uh, rho is not exactly one right now. Okay, so what, so I wanted to, I prepared this caricature plot just to give you an idea of, um, of how, of what, what a situation we might be in right now. Um, so what, suppose the, 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 the maximum energy that we can probe at the LHC is this Mx scale, and suppose new physics is somewhere at scale lambda, which is higher than Mx. So you will not be able to access directly or measure directly uh, new resonances due to these new states, but what you might be able to do is see deviations between the standard model and these new physics effects at the tail, just like what we are seeing here. This, however, will require you to calculate and uh, measure very precisely to see such deviations, which could be subtle. And of course, our hope is that this lambda is not very too far away from, uh, from Mx, with the energy we are probing. Okay, so there is actually an effective film, film, uh, theory framework which incorporates the points that they have just uh, mentioned so far, and it's called the standard model effective field theory. Um, it actually extends the standard model Lagrangian with um, higher dimensional operators. Uh, as you can see here, you have dimension six operators which are suppressed by lambda squared. Lambda is the scale of new physics, and those are the corresponding Wilson coefficients or the coupling constants, if you wish. We have dimension eight operators suppressed by lambda to the fourth, and then you can go on with towards higher uh, dimensional operators more in, the, in this expansion. So the important thing is that this lambda is much higher than the energy we are probing, and it's much higher than, than the Higgs vacuum expectation value. Um, there are all dimensional operators, um, but if, if, uh, since they violate lepton number and baryon numbers, or baryon numbers, we neglect them in here. And of course, one has to keep in mind that the RG running is important when comparing experiments of disparate uh, energies. Okay, so what might we find if when we analyze data using this framework? There are two possibilities. The best case scenario would be that we see a non-zero value for, 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 the Wilson, for a Wilson coefficient, which would indicate a mass scale which is slightly above um, the energy we are probing. And this would give you a definite energy target uh, for your future experiments. And alter the alternative scenario would be that uh, we don't see that, and we would spend our time putting constraints on the Wilson coefficients using uh, the available data from various experiments. And you know that you, they, this would allow you probably to constrain some Wilson coefficients very well, and other ones might be poorly constrained. And those directions that are poorly constrained might be the ones where we should search in because you know you don't understand them well. So it might help you might think of what experiments one should construct to constrain them better, um, and that would be one way to go. And of course, this null null search is, is not something that we are dealing with for the first time. Uh, lab was null search, but it played an extremely important role. So I see some kind of. Uh, blue lines in here and I don't know how they are appearing. <laughs> so LAP um, was a null search, but it did lead to important results. For example, it helped us narrow the window and allowed the values of the Higgs mass over the years, as you can see from this plot. Uh, and it brought it down to the point where we eventually, the value that was measured was in pretty good agreement with the constraints that we got um, through electric precision measurements of other observables. And it also helped us um, exclude some of the other new physics possibilities. Um, I'm sorry, but I see some kind of blue lines here on the screen. Okay, now they vanished. All right, so let's start with the first step, which is constructing this map. And um, so um, the first, of course, the thing to do is to have a non redundant basis of operators for each dimension. And um, uh, dimension six is the first stage. So the commonly used basis is the so-called Warsaw basis. Uh, you can look at these papers here uh, for, for details. And it classifies things or the operators based on the, on the type of interaction. So we have pure gauge interactions highlighted in light blue. Uh, the green shows you the gauge Higgs interactions. Dark blue shows you the Freeman Higgs gauge interactions. Red shows you the four Freeman interactions. And then we also have the baryon number violating interactions, which are not considered here. So 
the parameter counting tells us, or uh, based on, uh, on work that was done in the literature, we have 2,499 barium conserving operators for three generations, and you can reduce them down to order 100 with flavor assumptions, such as minimal flavor violation. And you can look at this paper for, uh, for detailed counting of these operators and the flavor assumptions. Dimension eight, of course, we expect to have more operators. And in fact, uh, we have 44,807 uh, for three generations. Uh, for one generation, for a single generation, you have 993 operators. And you can look at these references for more details. Okay, so SMEF does have some nice features. Um, the way it works here, the way we, we work is we fit the Wilson coefficient once, and then you can pick your favorite UV model, uh, calculate your Wilson coefficient, and see how it fits or, or how they fit in the, in the fitted range, how well they agree with the fitted range. Um, this, of course, will not probably give you just one possible model. It might give you a set of models, but the hope is that you reduce the number of possible models from a very large set into a small collection of them. And it also allows you a straightforward comparison of different experiments. So this is an example from a CP uh, violating gauge Higgs interaction from a work by Tribriano and collaborators. And we are looking at these two specific Wilson coefficients, some scalar gauge uh, Wilson coefficients. And so this is a plot from their paper and it shows you uh, the kind of constraints you can get, for example, by looking at the LHC with 36 inverse frame to barn, 300 inverse frame to barn, 3000 inverse frame to barn, you see how the constraints change as we go to higher luminosity. And we also have some constraints from lower energy experiments like uh, electric double moment. We have constraints, combining constraints here from, uh, from that and B2S gamma plus lab. Um, in this case, you see that a high luminosity LHC will be able to put better constraints on these Wilson coefficients than um, than the other choices in here or the other uh, possibilities in here. But you also see an example of a flood direction uh, for the low energy experiments. Um, so you can only, what does that mean? It means that you can only pro probe linear combination, but there are some linear combinations you're not sensitive to, and you need some uh, other experiments to get more uh, input to break these flood directions. Um, and in this case, LHC provides that, uh, that possibility to you. Okay, so besides having nice features, challenges, SMAT also has its own challenges. And um, so the predictions in SMAT are actually expansions in numerous parameters. You have expansions in alpha, you have expansions in alpha S, you have expansions in the vacuum expectation value squared over lambda squared and in E squared over lambda squared. And so for, um, for a reasonable prediction, you have to assess the conversion with respect to all these expansions. So, um, this is what the cross-section in SMAP looks like. You would have always a standard model P squared, that's the amplitude squared. And then you have the interference between the standard model and dimension six operators suppressed by lambda squared. And then we have a one of a lambda to the fourth piece, which has two contributions, the dimension six squared and the interference between dimension eight and the standard model. And there are a few questions that you can ask here. What's the impact of uh, QCD and electrical corrections on the leading uh, one over lambda squared term? Another question you may ask is what's the impact of this one over lambda to the fourth piece? Can we, for example, neglect it? So I will be addressing some of these questions later in my, uh, in my talk. So regarding QCD and electrical effects, it always helps to get some intuition of their importance by looking at the standard model. Um, so a focus of my talk is going to be on Julian. So here is a plot for Julian, the cross-section as a function of the rapidity of the Z. And you can see the impact of QCD corrections when you go from leading order to next leading order in green, they actually increase the cross-section by somewhere between 20 and 30%. So you do need them for any quantitative analysis. Um, electric corrections are also very important, especially when you are in the multi-TEV range, as you can see from this plot here, cross-section as a function of the invariant mass. So they grow at high energies and become increasingly important at, at, at future colliders. So they are also relevant to include in, in, in these predictions and they play an important role. So we expect something similar to happen with SMAFT. And in fact, the QCD corrections for Julian are the same between the standard model and SMAFT. So they are at the level 20 to 30% as well uh, for SMAFT. So that tells you that they are important to take into account. Okay, 
There are additional complications from higher order correction in SMEFT um, because they, they generate or induce the sensitivity to Wilson coefficients, which you did not have necessarily at three level uh, predictions. For example, through the uh, RG money where you have mixing of operators and that adds additional degrees of freedom to your global fits, which complicates life. Okay, so in the next um, few slides, we'll be looking at a couple of UV models uh, just to see what they tell us, what they predict for dimension six and dimension eight effect, and see if we can learn uh, anything from them. Okay, so I will start with the Z-prime case. Um, this is a sample diagram. Uh, we assume that the momentum transfer square P squared is much larger than any standard model mass, in particular the Z-mass. And we also assume that it's much smaller than the Z-prime mass squared. And so in that limit, you can take the propagator for the Z-prime uh, uh, particle and expand it in small p squared, and that gives you these two terms in here. The first one is a dimension six term, and the second one is a dimension eight term. And then you can use this to calculate your cross section, and you get these various terms that I'm showing down here, uh, the standard model square piece, which is proportional to the coupling constant in the standard model to the fourth, surpassed or divided by p to the fourth, the interference between dimension six and the standard model is proportional to the standard model coupling squared times the Z prime coupling squared divided by P squared times the Z mass prime squared. Then you have the dimension six squared, which is proportional to the coupling constant to the fourth divided by MZ prime to the fourth. And the interference term with dimension eight, uh, standard model and dimension eight has both the coupling for the standard model contribution, the Z prime one, and it's suppressed also by the Z prime mass to the fourth. So let me just copy this formula at the beginning of my slides so we can uh, study it a little better. Um, so you have a few questions you can ask or you can see if you can answer. Are the one over lambda to the fourth effects negligible compared to one over lambda squared? Can we say that immediately? And the answer is generically yes, if the momentum transfer squared is much smaller than the Z prime mass squared. Otherwise, one has to, to check before we can neglect them at, at high LHC energies. And the other question that you can ask is related to this piece in here. Are dimension eight terms negligible compared to dimension six squared terms? Is this something that we can say immediately? And the question is, it, this wouldn't be true. It's not true generically, generically um, in this example, if the standard model coupling squared is much smaller than the G GZ prime squared, yes. But otherwise, this is not something absolute. You cannot immediately say this is smaller than this. So in general, if we use just dimension six squared as a proxy for the full one over lambda to the fourth, even though it is clear it's simpler to calculate because you have smaller uh, bases, it doesn't necessarily capture the correct UV behavior. Okay, so let's look at the second model. This is the Roman standard graviton. And again, P squared is much larger than any standard model mass squared, and it's smaller than the, the mass of the, the state, which I denote here, uh, graviton state that I denote, denote here by MS, capital S. And so this is a case where dimension six is zero, and you start immediately at dimension eight. So the first time in this expansion is P squared over MS to the fourth. So when you write down your cross section, you have the standard model piece. Uh, this is the first term. You have zero for the interference of dimension six with the standard model or dimension six squared. And then you only have the interference between dimension eight and the standard model proportional to the standard model squared coupling uh, divided by MS to the fourth. So this example actually shows you that, you know, you have to take into account dimension eight because you could have dimension six vanishing for all sorts of reasons. Uh, you could have them vanish for some similar reasons in certain observables, and you can, you can get more details in, in this paper here. Uh, but in general, we cannot just say, let's go ahead and neglect them. So what's the, the moral and recap of, uh, of all that I have shown you so far in these introductory slides, and it's my moral, so um, people can have different opinions. Given the fact that different UV models can lead to very different patterns between dimension six and dimension eight coefficients, we should try our best to make as few assumptions as possible regarding their relative size in SMAP studies and just let the data tell us what the allowed range is. Um, and to summarize the subtleties we have discussed so far, 
how we identify a sufficiently broad set of observables to remove these uh, to flat, uh, remove flat directions from SMAP fits. Are dimension eight effects relevant for the data sets we are considering? What is the impact of higher order corrections? So in the next slides, I will actually focus on the first two bullets. Uh, we have done work also associated with the third bullet, but I don't have time to cover it in this uh, talk. Um, I've noticed it from previous lectures you had here that you, uh, people have addressed at this point. So you've gotten a flavor of the importance of this particular point here. So I will not uh, cover it in my talk. Okay, so let's start with removing flat LHC flat directions. And the work I will be describing is, uh, you can find more details in this paper with our postdoc, Daniel Began and, and with Frank Petriello as well. Okay, so we will study this issue of flood directions in the semi-electronic four frame sector of the SMAP. We are going to be working with Julian data. One reason we have focused on Julian is that the precision of, of the measurements for this process are really very, is very beautiful actually. And it makes a lot of sense to try to see what we can learn from this process regarding the Wilson coefficients parameter space. And you can see from this cross section as a function of the environment mass that, you know, even when you go to the TEV range or so, and we are looking here at 2.8 inverse Cantu bar, the uncertainty can be at a level of 20 to 30% or so. And as we add more luminosity, this will go down, uh, obviously. Um, these are some sample diagrams that we have uh, considered. Um, uh, this is the four frequent contribution. These are the standard model ones. And we are looking at six, um, seven dim dimension six operators in here. There are other operators that affect the Z uh, frame number attacks, but since they have been um, uh, constrained strongly by electric precision measurements, they are not the focus uh, for us here. So in this initial study, we are going to, for the flood direction, we will work at dimension six and leading audio couplings, and we will come back to dimension eight later on in my uh, later parts of my slides. Okay, so, since higher dimensional operators are actually, they have the most impact at high energy, um, we decided to start by analytically studying the amplitude squared in the high energy limit, S hat, much larger than MZ squared, just to see what qualitative understanding we can get um, about the fits to Julian data. And so this is now the cross section, differential cross section in the environment mass squared, uh, the rapidity of the Z and the cosine theta, which is the center of mass frame scattering angle of the negatively charged lepton. So it's simple, you have a term proportional to the uh, minus time variable T hat squared, another term proportional to U hat squared. A1 and A2 uh, contain the contributions from the various Wilson coefficients, as you can see in here. So these are corresponding to the uptype uh, quark, and we are looking at the interference of photon with SMAP and Z with SMAP. And you have similar terms for the downtype quark. So U hat and T hat, you can actually write them in terms of S hat and the cosine theta, uh, as I'm showing you here in this uh, red box. And when you plug those into this expression, you get two simple terms. You will have a term A1 plus A2 times one plus cosine square theta. And you have a second term A1 minus A2 times cosine theta. So the best case you can do here is prop two linear combinations of the Wilson coefficients uh, with this observable. And the situation actually gets worse because for some of the observables, we integrate in a symmetric way over cosine theta, for example, for the environment mass of leptons. So when you do that, you lose this second linear combination, A1 minus A2 times cosine theta. And you are only left with one of the two linear combinations, namely the one that is proportional to one plus cosine square theta, uh, which multiplies A1 plus A2. So you can see from here that the invariant mass and the rapidity distribution can only probe one combination of uh, Wilson coefficients. So one question you may ask yourself, if I want to maintain both linear combinations, is there an observable that I can measure for which I'm not integrating in a symmetric way over cosine theta? And the answer is yes, that's the forward backward asymmetry uh, for leptons, as, um, as you can see from this uh, uh, plot in here. This is the differential cross section as a function of the rapidity of, uh, of leptons um, and is differentiating these variables in here. So Atlas has done a measurement for this observable, but the highest invariant mass bin they have looked at was actually 150 to 200 GeV. So that's a low invariant mass bin. And so SMAFT effects are not going to be significant in there. So even though this could allow us to get additional information, the fact that we don't, we don't have yet the high environment mass measurements doesn't make it very useful for us. 
Um, are there other observables where we have measurement in the higher environment mass spins? The answer is yes. This is an example on, on the left. Uh, we are looking at the pseudo rapidity difference of leptons. The unfortunate thing is that it is symmetric and there, um, the integration or it, uh, the integration uh, you know, from, of course, I did that from minus one to one. So again, it doesn't help you uh, with this issue. So the question is, are there other data sets? Before I go on with the with with, the, with this particular point, I wanted to emphasize that we will be using for our analysis ATV twenty inverse per to one uh, Drillian data um, in our fits. And even though it goes only to one point five TeV in the invariant mass and not higher, the beauty of this data set is that Atlas has provided a detailed account of the experimental error matrix because this was meant to be a standard model measurement. So they did it as precisely as possible and as clean as, as, as it can get. So we, this is the data set that we will be using for our um, fits later on. So coming back to the question, are there other data sets that will help us uh, deal with the, the flat direction? The answer is yes. Uh, we have polarized the IS at the future electron ion collider. Um, this is a planned experiment at, at BNL, as you may know. Center of mass energy is 140 GeV. The polarization of the proton slash electron beams is at, at level 70%. That's the plan. Uh, luminosity will be greater than or equal to 10 inverse spin to bond. And these are simple uh, diagrams that contribute to our uh, cross section. And to give you a flavor of what the actual cross section looks like, this is here the interference of photon with SMAFT for the uptype quark. This is D2 sigma over dx dq squared, x is Bjorken x, q squared is the momentum transfer. And so you can see from this expression that these Wilson coefficients come in here accompanied with polarization factors. So you can disentangle the effect of this Wilson coefficient through a collection of polarized observables. And in fact, we have five observables to work with, and they correspond to having either n polarized nucleon with polarized electrons or polarized nucleons with polarized electrons. So that gives you four observables here. And the fifth is the charged current. The charged current turned out not to add much to the, to the mix, but it's a fifth observable that you could also work with. And you can also bin in Y. Y is the inelasticity. So that gives you an additional kinematic handle. And so you have a lot of observables to work with in this case. Okay, so let's see, let's perform the fit. Uh, for our fit, we used the high mass Atlas data. We used simulated EIC data and a combination of the two. And this is here a summary of the technical details. Uh, we use the full experimental correlation matrix provided by Atlas in this paper here. Uh, we have five EIC observables, as I just mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, we assume 70% EIC polarization for both beams. Uh, we use 10 inverse prim to bond, but we also check the impact of 100 inverse prim to bond. Uh, we used 1% systematic error per bin. This is the number that we have found in various experimental papers. Uh, but we also checked what happens if we double it, maybe 2%. And we are using nine bins in X and Q squared. Q squared is greater than 12 GeV squared, and X is less than 0.2. Constraints we put just to make sure that we don't have two large theory errors. Because if you go to two large values of x, you have large PDF errors. If you go to values of q squared that are too low, power corrections kick in. So uh, this makes sure that you don't get into those um, regions. And so we are going to now study four representative Wilson coefficient choices. Some of them will correspond to possibilities of uh, where you will not be sensitive to BSM effects. So in case one, and this is all done analytically in the high energy limit. We are basically studying this, some of these five directions analytically in the high energy limit. So in case one, we assume that CEU, CED, and CLQ1 are different from zero. And if you go back to the slide where I showed you some algebraic steps, you will see that these correspond only or contribute only to the U hat square term in the Drenian matrix element uh, squared. So, you have basically two linear combinations, one from the uptype quark, one from the downtype quark, and three Wilson coefficients. You will not be able to determine all of them. What we are doing here basically is looking for values of the Wilson coefficients for which the SMAP corrections vanish, because that would be uh, a region in your parameter space that you would not be sensitive to, a flat direction, in other words. So here you have a flat direction. Case two corresponds to CQE, CEU, and CED different from zero. Now, in principle, those are distinguishable because they contribute to the T hat and the U hat term. 
terms. So you have enough equations to work with once you take the up and the down type quark. However, in reality, two of these linear combinations vanish when you integrate over cosine theta, as I showed earlier. So you find yourself back to the same situation of case one, which means you have flat direction. In case three, we assume CQE and CLQ1 different from zero. And if you try to solve for both the uptype and the downtype uh, uh, quark equations, you will see that they lead to contradictory conditions for the same also coefficients, which simply means that you don't have a flat direction. And case four corresponds to CLQ1 and CLQ3 different from zero. And similarly, we find that there is no flat direction in here. So all of this is based on some analytic study uh, in the high energy limit. And later on, we check whether what we are finding here is in, does correspond to what we get from the numerical fit. So let's look at some phenomenology. And before we go on, um, it's good to see how the SMELT cross-section compares to the standard model. Uh, this is the cross-section as a function of the orbit X. Uh, and you can see that the unpolarized case, uh, which is in blue, and the polarized cross-section, the deviations, both of them are larger than the actual PDF errors. These are the PDF errors that you see in banks here, and the deviations are actually larger. So the PDF errors will not be a limiting factor in this map effects uh, studies later on. Then let's look at the lower part of uh, the lower plot. So uh, we are looking here at the ratio of CLQ1 over CEU as a function of the invariant mass. And so we wanted to test how good is this high energy limit uh, approximation is. And it's only good if it agrees with um, the exact cross section that you calculate without making any assumption um, in the high uh, invariant mass spins. So the green dashed line is actually what you get in the high energy limit. That's the plot direction uh, that you get in the high energy uh, limit for s hat larger than mz squared. And you have a second line here, or curve here, which is blue. And the way we got it was by taking the cross section, not making any assumption, like we don't use the high energy limit uh, approximation. And we solve for values of the Wilson coefficients for which SMAFT effects vanish bin by bin. We do that numerically. And what you can see is that this blue curve overlaps with the green one as we start going to higher environment mass bins. So this, uh, high, um, this high mass limit is actually an accurate one, but you also see that the lower environment mass bins break the flood direction weekly. Uh, we say weekly because those bins, you know, SMAFT effects are small there. They scale like MLS squared over lambda squared. So when you go to lower invariant mass bins, you are less sensitive to SMAFT effect. And, you know, this observation here is important because you will see later on that we, when we do the fit, we don't get an open-ended band, we actually get an ellipse. And that's because of these lower bins that weakly break the flat direction. Okay, so now we do the, the numerical fit. And we'll start with case one. So we're looking now at CEU versus CLQ1. Um, and we plot LHC, uh, Drillian data on one hand, and then also the EIC results, as I said, for 10 inverse to one, and then we combine it to see what we get. And you can see immediately that LHC has flat direction. That's this elongated blue ellipse. And as I said, it's an ellipse and not an open-ended band uh, because of those means that break the, the flat direction in the lower environment mass bins region. EIC does not have a flat direction, as you can see. And so when you combine both, you get much stronger constraints uh, on the Wilson coefficients. Okay, so um, you might ask yourself, will high luminosity LHC uh, results help us eventually in removing these flat directions? And to answer that, it's actually good to look at this table, which corresponds to 80 V and 20 inverse femto barn. And it shows you the, you know, the environment mass bins, the corresponding statistical error, the systematic error. What you see is that the lower environment mass bins have um, a larger systematic error. The higher ones have a larger statistical error. So while the high luminosity LHC would improve the statistical error in these higher environment mass bins, the fact we have a flat direction there, so that doesn't help as much. The lower invariant mass bins break the flat direction, but as you can see, first of all, they are limited by systematic errors, which are not easily reducible as we go to high, LNG, uh, high luminosity LHC, plus SMAFT effects are pretty small or small in that region. So we don't expect much of a help from the high luminosity LHC in terms of this flat, removing these flat directions. So case two corresponds to um, what you've seen here. So we are looking at CEU versus CQE. 
Um, when we plot, we see that we get a flat direction. Again, that's what this elongated ellipse shows us from the NHC. Uh, the AIC does not have a flat direction in here. And when we combine both, we get strong constraints. So for this particular case, if we had measurements of the forward-backward asymmetry in the higher invariant mass bins, um, that would help somewhat. For the time being, we don't have such measurements. Case three, if you remember from studying things analytically, we did not see a flat direction. This is now the plot. And indeed, you can see that LHC has no flat direction in here. And you can see that it's when there is no flat direction, LHC data can constrain things in, in, in a strong way. So in this case, it's much better than DIS, uh, polarized DIS with 10 or with 100 inverse point to barn. Okay, so we also looked at the impact of increasing the systematic errors for the EIC and uh, adding the polarization versus not having it. So the left side corresponds to going from a systematic error of 1% to 2%. You can see that it doesn't change the fit match, but the polarization plays an important role. So this is the unpolarized case in yellow and blue includes polarization. And you can see that the bounce becomes significantly um, stronger when you add the polarization. So polarization here is a, is a critical element for, for this analysis. Okay, so this brings me to the second point that I wanted to discuss here, which is the impact of dimension eight effects on Brillian at the LHC. So this is actually based on work we have done in this paper with uh, Emmanuel Margetti and uh, Frank Petriello. And um, now we are going to turn on dimension eight operators in Drillian and we'll check their impact. And there are four categories of operators that contribute at dimension eight. And I will show you examples um, on, on these coming slides. And the critical point here is how they scale with energy, how strongly they scale with energy. So the first category is shown here. Uh, you have uh, four fermions and two um, derivatives in here. So these are examples of such category here. Um, those are momentum dependent four fermion interactions and they contribute or they scale like S hat squared over lambda to the fourth. So they scale strongly with energy. Then we have the second category that you dress your dimension six operator with two Higgses. And here are examples of that. Uh, those are momentum independent corrections to four fermion terms, and they contribute at uh, the order of S hat V squared over lambda to the fourth. V is a vacuum expectation value of the Higgs. So this can less strongly with energy than the category on the left. We do have uh, another category of um, operators with derivatives, uh, where the derivative acts or is, is dis distributed differently uh, among the fields. So that's an example of such terms. Uh, this left-right arrow for the covariant derivative just means that you have a covariant derivative that acts on the right minus another one that acts on the left. And the parentheses here just refer to symmetrization or symmetrizing over the indices. So this is actually an interesting category of operators because it leads to some novel angular dependencies, which we have studied in this paper here. But once you integrate over the lithonic angle, they vanish. So for our uh, environment mass distribution study that we are for data that we are using here and for the fit, those operators will not contribute. But if you are interested just in looking at studying the angular dependence, this is actually an interesting category of operators. Okay. Then we have the third category. You uh, you have you dress up your four six dimension six operators with three derivatives. So these are um, examples of that. Uh, so those are momentum dependent z vertex corrections and they contribute at the order of v squared s hat over lambda to the fourth. And then the final category um, is shown here. So those are momentum independent z vertex corrections and they contribute at order v to the fourth over lambda to the fourth. Okay, so let's now um, study some of, of these operators and their impact. Uh, so uh, the setup of our SMAFT calculations is summarized in, in this slide. So we are looking at the cross-section differentiation in the invariant mass of leptons. You have your standard model piece, and then you have um, the sum of the dimension six and dimension eight um, contributions. One is suppressed by lambda squared, the other is suppressed by lambda to the fourth. We denote those by AI. 
And then the BIJ corresponds to the dimension six squared contributions, which are suppressed by lambda to the fourth. Um, so analog QCD corrections are included to all the AIs and the BIJs uh, terms. Uh, they increase the leading order result by approximately 30%. Uh, the standard model was computed up to N and QCD, and we included electric effects that are available in the literature. Um, in the numeric results, we choose lambda to be 4 TeV. This is far above the invariant mass upper bound of 1.5 TeV in the ATLAS data uh, that we are studying. And so it's complete, our calculation is complete to order alpha S over lambda squared. It's complete to order one over lambda to the fourth. Um, at the order alpha s over lambda to the fourth, we are missing only the real emission operators of the form shown here. Um, we expect their contribution to be small uh, for the invariant mass because there is no soft or collinear enhancement. Uh, if you are looking at order distributions, those operators can become important. Okay, so <clears throat> the first step or the first thing we, we, we wanted to do here is to study the impact of the quadratic dimension six terms. And so we are going to consider the linear AI terms for the four frame in dimension six terms, uh, which scale like one over lambda squared. And we are going to see the impact of the quadratic term on the fit one, once we include them. And um, so the plot, here's a plot that shows you two uh, Wilson coefficients that we have uh, looked at. So uh, we're looking at, it at the cross section uh, differential in MNL, as I said before, and the important part of these plots is the inset, the lower part. So this is looking at the quadratic term divided by the linear term. And what you can see is that the ratio increases with the invariant mass, and it can reach up to 50% once we hit one TeV and we go above it. So these are large corrections, the dimension six squared effects. And these corrections are even larger when you uh, for the CLU uh, coefficients. So it just tells you that you cannot actually neglect the dimension six squared contributions. Uh, these quadratic terms, as I said, they can uh, reach up to 100% on the right-hand side, but vary between 20 and 100%. Even for invariant masses of 700 GeV, they are, um, they are important. And you may think that you have a UV cutoff of 4 TeV, and so let's say for va values of the invariant mass of 700 GeV, you may not have effects from these terms, but what we see here is that even around 700 GeV or so, the corrections are not negligible. And if you compare them to the uncertainties, the experimental uncertainties, uh, they are 7% 7, 7 in the second to last bin and 17% in the last bin. So they are less than the shift you are actually seeing uh, from adding these dimension six squared contributions. Okay, so now let's look at the impact of dimension eight terms. And here uh, we looked um, at some of the operators I have already uh, presented earlier. So on the left-hand side, we are looking at two types of Wilson coefficients. One of them dresses the dimension six with two Higgses and the other one dresses it with two derivatives. So blue versus orange. And again, the lower part of the plot is the interesting one. What you see is that as I go to high invariant mass uh, contributions, I see that the, the blue contribution or the, the operators with the two derivatives are significantly larger than the ones with two Higgses. So they are the important, most important ones here. And the reason is that they scale strongly with energy. They have this scaling of S squared over lambda to the fourth, as I pointed out before. Um, if you look at the right-hand side, we are looking at some vertex contributions here. This, the no, the, this notation of one minus two is just some, a way for us of combining some linear, linear, some vertex corrections. And you can look at the paper, how we define them. But at first sight, you might think that these vertex corrections are giving you a similar level of, um, of, uh, of shift. However, if you look at the values we chose for the Wilson coefficient, they are pretty much unrealistic. We are talking here about 10 to the fourth. On the left, we chose these Wilson coefficients to vary between plus and minus 10. This is 10 to the fourth. So if we want to look for the effect of these operators for more realistic values of the Wilson coefficients, for example, plus or minus 10, we will have to take these corrections and divide them by 1,000 because dimension eight effects are linear in, in the Wilson coefficients. And that will show you that these corrections will be completely um, small and negligible. So from this plot, actually what you see is that the most important operators are the ones that have two derivatives. Um, and as I said, the reason is that they scale strongly with energy as had squared over lambda to the fourth is their scaling. Okay, so um, let's start with a single Kaplan analysis and look at uh, dimension six for fermions. So what we are going to do here is turn on a single operator at a time. 
and we begin with dimension six for primary operators, study the impact of dimension six squared um, in the fit. Um, so the experimental error matrix here was, as I said, provided by Atlas. We use NLPDF errors and our QCD scale variation errors were included. And the chi square per degrees of freedom is less than or equal to one for most fits, so it's a reasonable fit. So what you see from this plot showing you the various Wilson coefficients um, and the 95% confidence level range for, for the fit, uh, blue is the dimension six and red includes dimension six squared into the fit. And you can immediately see that blue and red are different for many of these coefficients. Um, in fact, you have large shifts from this one over lambda to the fourth uh, effects. And by factors of two to three for some of these Wilson coefficients like CQE, CLD, and CEU. We can define here an effective UV scale to see if we are still in the region of validity of the EFT. So dimension six scales like um, C over lambda squared. So you can define an effective scale lambda over square root of C. If you calculate it using these red um, bars, you will see that it's roughly four TeV. So we are well above uh, the upper mass limit of 1.5 TeV. So we are still within the range of validity of EFT. So these bonds are actually meaningful. So now we look at the single, um, Captain analysis uh, using the, the now dimension eight contributions. And we are of course focusing on the momentum dependent for premium contributions, which we saw are the largest. And so here are the various Wilson coefficients. And you can see immediately that the bounds now are looser than what we have said that we have when we have seen in the previous slide. And notice the range, the range here, sorry. The range of the Wilson coefficients here was between minus eight and four. When you add dimension eight effects, the range changes to minus 100 to 40. So these bounds are much more relaxed than what we have just with dimension six squared. And the effective scales problem here reached two TeV for several operators. Um, so here you cannot clearly neglect dimension eight momentum dependent for frame operators in the fit to current data. Okay, so now uh, we did something else. We did a multi-coupling um, analysis. And for simplicity, we turned on all the operators that affect the right-handed up quark and electrons. So um, the first column shows you the Wilson coefficients we looked at, the dimension six and the various dimension eight ones, two derivatives, uh, those which are dressed up with two derivatives, two Higgses and the vertex corrections. And so in the first step, in this first column, we turn on only a single coupling uh, and, but we include dimension six squared. And so these are the pits that you get. In particular, this is the range for CEU. In the next step, what we did, we allowed all the Wilson coefficients to vary freely, but we put constraints on the last two operators. We demanded that the effective scale should be greater than one TV for these last two operators. And the reason is, if you remember, we've seen that their contribution is very small. So the only reason for us to have any sensitivity for them is if the Wilson coefficients take extremely high and realistic values. So to make sure that they don't drag the fit to this region of unrealistic values, we put this condition on their um, effective scale. And that fit shows that CEU, the range for CEU now, squared. Uh, so the bounds on dimension six are significantly weakened by turning on <clears throat> uh, these dimension eight operators. So what you can see actually from this is that this dimension six and dimension eight contributions are entangled in some sense because one of them impacts the other. And so one question you may ask yourself is how do I separate dimension six from dimension eight effects of the LHC? And that was um, work that we have done um, in this paper, again, with our postdoc, uh, Daniel Beacon. Okay, so, so you've seen that there's a significant entanglement between dimension six and dimension eight effects of the NHC. Um, so since this effect, this two derivative dimension eight operators we, will be most important in the high invariant mass bin since they scale with energy like S hat squared over lambda to the fourth. One solution that might come to your mind is to just drop off those higher invariant mass bins. This is not a solution I would advocate for because it removes the point from having um, a high energy collider. 
and one has to think of something better. Um, so, so these are the dimension six contributions that we are looking at that don't integrate to zero. And these are their dimension eight extensions uh, with, with two derivatives. And the difference between this, the right and the left is actually a factor of S hat squared over lambda to the fourth. Uh, so no, S hat over lambda squared between right and left, between dimension eight and dimension six is just S hat over lambda squared. So you might think that the invite mass distribution will behave differently for, between, for the two um, and give you some, some way of disentangling between the two, but in reality, it doesn't. Uh, we have checked that and it does not. So we actually do need to look for some, something else. And so this something else that we have um, come up with is to look at low energy experiments for a simple reason, because of their low center of mass energy, they are not sensitive to dimension eight, they are primarily sensitive to dimension six and they can help you put stronger constraints on them. And then you can release the LHC data to focus on the dimension eight contributions. Um, so there are several future high precision parity violating uh, low energy experiments that are planned. So two of them are mentioned here. One of them is called SOLID. It's planned at JLab. Uh, the momentum transfer squared varies between 20 and 10 GeV and it scatters an electron off a deuteron. And there is P2, which is planned at mines. Uh, this is 155 MeV electrons that are scattered off a hydrogen or a carbon target. And they are measuring the difference between the right and left-handed um, electrons. So these experiments were built actually to, for other purposes. So one of their goals is to measure precisely sine square theta. Um, they are also sensitive to certain combinations of uh, the electron quark vector and axial couplings. They can be interpreted as BSM searches as well. So you, since they have sensitivity to some of the Wilson coefficients we are interested in, why not use this data to get some information on the Wilson coefficients, especially given the expected precision on these experiments. So what we found is that P2 gives much stronger constraints than solid. This is why my fits are going to be showing you um, P2 uh, and not solid. Uh, so in this example, we turn on both the dimension six and dimension eight effects or, or operators, left-handed for premium operators and uh, fit them to LHC data, P2, and then the, the, the combination of the two. So here is an example of this dimension eight uh, Wilson coefficient versus a dimension six. Uh, you can see the blue ellipse that corresponds to the LHC. Uh, if we turn off dimension eight contributions, uh, here are the bounds that you get, you get certain bounds, but once you turn on dimension eight contribution, the bounds are much closer. That's what you see in here. Uh, P2 corresponds to this narrow uh, yellow band. So uh, we assume the standard model. So it's basically putting tight bands around zero. And when you combine the two, you get stronger constraints on your Wilson coefficients. And so in fact, um, this is what you would have without including P2 this is what you have uh, when you input P2. So this joint fit with P2 severely constrains the allowed range of the dimension six coefficients, which frees the LHC Drillian data to constrain the dimension eight effect. That's what we see from these um, fits in here. Okay, so that brings me pretty much to the summary of my talk. Predictions in SMAFT are difficult. There is absolutely no question about that. There are many expansions, expansions in many parameters that one has to control. Um, effects beyond leading order in all of these expansions are demonstrably needed to obtain robust probes at the LHC and elsewhere. I would say it's worth the effort. It's complicated, but it's worth the effort. This program will help maximize the legacy of the LHC and will provide a solid foundation to build upon with future experimental studies. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. Thank you so much for this very Thank good uh, lecture. And the, now I'll open the floor for Q&A. Uh, anything you want to ask uh, anyone, just raise your hand or write something in the chat and we'll unmute you. And also I encourage all the SMEFTI or co-organizers to, to express their uh, Various. Uh, I see a hand. Yeah, Cliff. <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. You just you're just co-host. You just speak. Yeah, but it sounds it, it seems seems like I'm in, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm flaunting the the uh, the ability to mute, which is <laughs> doesn't seem fair. <laughs> so so I had a question. You know, I liked your talk very much, and I, and uh, thank you for that. And uh, I also liked the fact that you were uh, 
careful about about you know do you have control over the approximations when you're looking at the dimension eight operators. But if I've understood that, that what you said uh, correctly, you're doing an expansion in powers of one fourth. Is that yeah? You because know, it's one one over c over lambda squared is a fourth. Yeah, we're not squared, the, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, 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 you know, I can kind of see that, that in practice, if all your coefficients in the expansion, if all the numerical coefficients in the expansion are basically one, then one fourth isn't so bad, but, but how do you know that, that uh, you're not going to get factors of four or eight or something in the numerical coefficients in that kind of expansion? It seems like it's on the edge of control. Is that fair? Sure. Yeah, so what we are seeing, so you're asking about a higher dimensional operator beyond what's seen here right now. So, I mean, what you see, what I try to reflect through this effective scale, you could see that th this expansion is converging. You could see that the effective scale was 4 TeV at dimension six, became 2 TeV at dimension eight. So you can see that you are slowly losing sensitivity to these higher order uh, operators. Um, there is convergence, that's what I mean. However, what you could do if you have any kind of doubts, you could maybe take the leading terms in the next order, look at those terms with four derivatives and see if they are going to change your fit. So that's one thing you could do. But to me, it looks like there is a convergence by studying these effective scales. So that's interesting in the, to the extent that it means that, um, you know, you don't have to be asymptotically in the, in the large Lambda regime to control the expansion. So, you know, I know that in the early in your talk, you, you took examples like Z prime exchanges where you actually knew everything and could look at the, uh, you could compare it to the operator expansion. So to, to what extent is it true uh, if you do examples like that, that you uh, have control over everything uh, that, um, you know, what would you say this, the smallest uh, C, uh, Lambda over C is that, that you can afford to to, to use, are you kind of at the at the limit there? Or? Um, I think you have to always check compared to what is the highest mass bin you are. For example, in our case, we were always checking that we are above that highest mass bin that we are using from the experimental measurement, like it was 1.5 TV. You, you have to stay above that to make sure that you are within the range of validity of your EFT. So you have to check that. That's basically what we've been trying to do in every step. And above that means like factor two above that. A factor right. two above that is what you use, or especially basically, right? <laughs> you have to be above that, yeah. But a factor of two or more, yeah, that's an acceptable uh -huh. factor, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Here we come. Someone else had a hand raised. Yeah, I, I, I've raised my hand also. Um, hi, Roger. Thanks. So hi. Much how are you, Tom? I'm good. <laughs> Um, so I had a question about uh, these evanescent operators, which I know you've studied in the past. So I, I guess the question is, you know, as you've been uh, doing more and more of these calculations, is there anything, anything new to say there? Um, I haven't thought about it at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm smart to tell you, I haven't thought about it, sorry. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, any other question? No one has a question. Uh, well, so I, I, I want to ask you, um, so what, what do you think would be uh, the next direction in the analysis of Drellian data? OK, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Michelle. So I'd say that Drillian offers you many kinematic handles that you could use to learn more about um, other operators that we haven't looked at in, in here. So in our analysis, we focus on the invite mass uh, observable. Um, there is a subset of operators I mentioned earlier we have neglected. Those are the real radiation operators. They are not very relevant for this distribution, but if you are looking, for example, at PT distributions, they are important. They become important, especially in the high PT range. So you could imagine studying these operators using this particular data set because it's actually the PT of the Z was measured also very precisely. You could learn about the parameter space or this Wilson coefficient of these operators using that distribution. So that's a possible direction to go towards. And I'm sure there is more to think about too. Okay, thank you. Here we go. Um, I don't see any other hands and no other questions. So uh, let's give it up again to Raja. Unmute yourself, whoever wants thank to. You. And uh, we'll be back next week with a lecture of uh, Gino Isidori. So uh, I invite you all to join us. And uh, thank you.